Welcome to my video on uh, Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel. You may wish to check out my other videos on this text before this one or after this one. Uh, like and subscribe to my channel to see what else I've got. This is the first of the videos I'm making where I'm going to actually read from the text and provide close analysis as I go. Okay, the first thing to note is that it has an epigraph. If you look at my video, which is on, gives an overview of the text, uh, it also does an analysis of this epigraph that you will probably find uh, interesting and relevant to your study. So I'll just direct you to that. I'm going to move on with the text. Okay, so in, in my overview, I go over how the text has nine sections and each has several chapters in it. So the first section is the theatre. The first thing, uh, even before I start to read, is I just want to introduce you to uh, Shakespeare's play King Lear because I only get into the second sentence of this reading before the play becomes relevant. King Lear, if, just to give you a bit of a background to the play, King, in King Lear, the King of England is aging and he um, has three daughters and comes up with this idea to divide his kingdom up and give it to his daughters. And he requires that they uh, kind of tell him how much they love him and he's going to give it to the ones that love him the most. The two older daughters put on a bit of a show and uh, really uh, play up in a bit of an insincere way how much they love him. The third daughter, Cordelia, who really does love him, refuses to engage in that sort of display and instead says she loves him as a daughter should love a father and no more. He doesn't find this enough and banishes her from the kingdom and gives his um, wealth to the other two sisters who are, are not um, good people. He, um, he then goes mad and uh, a whole lot of other things happen. It's a really famous play by Shakespeare. And in fact, one of the main themes of the text or one of the recurrent themes of the text is the importance of, of parents um, building strong relationships with their children. Arthur, the main character, who um, we'll go on to learn more about, he um, loses connection to his son Tyler, and uh, you know this is the um, the tragedy of his life. It's something that's mirrored in in the play that he's acting in uh, when he dies. It's also played out in um, Kirsten, the little girl that will come to meet who. Uh, has lost some some what her connection to her own parents and in Jeevan uh, who um, expresses in in this um, first chapter a, a desire to have children and something that he later goes on to to have and is, it, it's shown to bring him a lot of joy um, spending time with his children so it's, it is one of the themes of the of the novel the importance of that relationship and the terrible um, sadness that people experience if they can't prioritise it. Okay, so I'll just um, that, that's enough of an introduction, I think, to to King Lear. The king stood in a pool of blue light, unmoored. Now, as I go, I love to highlight words, and I love this word unmoored because it means unattached to anything, and this. I just have in my mind, I have this image of this stage and this man standing on it and all of the connections to other people that he should have in his life are broken, severed, and he's not attached to anything. Um, so I love that that's here because as the story progresses, this first line tells us about the main character who's actually playing the king and how unmoored he is in his life, how disconnected from everybody he, he actually is. So it's a really significant uh, first line. This was Act 4 of King Lear, a winter night at the Elgin Theatre in Toronto. Earlier in the evening, three little girls had played a clapping game on stage as the audience entered, childhood versions of, King's, of, of Lear's daughters, and now they'd returned as hallucinations in the mad scene. 
So Lear goes crazy uh, in the course of this play, and it's very famous. He wanders around in a storm um, going crazy. The king stumbled and reached for them as they flitted here and there in the shadows. His name was Arthur Leander. He was 51 years old, and there were flowers in his hair. Now, you've probably seen pictures of King Lear being, you know, being advertised and so forth. Um, and one of the famous images from the play is the king with, instead of a, a crown on his head, a uh, crown of flowers on his head. Dost thou know me? The actor playing Gloucester asked. I remember thine eyes well enough. Arthur said, distracted by the child versions of Cordelia, and this was when it happened. There was a change in his face. He stumbled. He reached for a column but misjudged the distance and struck it hard with the side of his hand. Down from the waist they are centaurs, he said. And not only was this the wrong line, but the delivery was wheezy, his voice barely audible. He cradled his hand to his chest like a broken bird. The actor portraying Edgar was watching him closely. It was still possible at that moment that Arthur was acting, but in the first row of the orchestra section, a man was rising from his seat. He'd been trained to be a paramedic. The man's girlfriend tugged at his sleeve, hissed, Jeevan, what are you doing? And Jeevan himself wasn't sure at first, but rose behind him murmuring for him to sit. An usher was moving towards him. Snow began to fall over the stage. The wren goes to it, Arthur whispered, and Jeevan, who knew the play very well, realised that the actor had skipped back twelve lines. The wren. Sir, the usher said, would you please? But Arthur Leander was running out of time. He swayed, his eyes unfocused, and it was obvious to Jeevan that he wasn't Lear anymore. Jeevan pushed the usher aside and made a dash for the steps leading up to the stage that a second usher was jogging down the aisle, which forced Jeevan to throw himself at the stage without the benefit of stairs. It was higher than he thought, and he had to kick the first usher who'd grasped hold of his sleeve. The snow was plastic, Jeevan noted peripherally, little bits of translucent plastic clinging to his jacket and brushing against his skin. Edgar and Gloucester were distracted by the commotion, neither of them looking at Arthur, who was leaning on a plywood column, staring vacantly. There were shouts from backstage, two shadows approaching quickly, but Jeevan had reached Arthur by now, and he caught the actor as he lost consciousness, eased him gently to the floor. The snow was falling fast around them, shimmering in blue-white light. Arthur wasn't breathing. The two shadows, security men, had stopped a few paces away, presumably catching on by now that Jeevan wasn't a deranged fan. The audience was a clamour of voices, flashes from cell phone cameras, indistinct exclamations in the dark. Jesus Christ, Edgar said. Oh, Jesus. He'd dropped the British accent he'd been using earlier and now sounded as if he were from Alabama, which in fact he was. Gloucester had pulled away the gauze bandage that had covered half his face. And in the play, Gloucester has his eye poked out, which is why he's got the bandage on. By this point in the play, his character's eyes had been put out. There you go, I didn't have to say that, it's right there. And seemed frozen in place, his mouth opening and closing like a fish. Arthur's heart wasn't beating. Jeevan began CPR. Someone shouted an order and the curtain dropped. A whoosh of fabric and shadow that removed the audience from the equation and reduced the brilliance of the stage by half. The plastic snow was still falling. And one of the things I want people to note is the uh, references to uh, fake things in this. You've got plastic snow, and uh, a little little while back um, you had uh, plywood. If I could find it, I'd, I'd highlight it. But we had plywood, a plywood column, and... Uh, you know, these are, these are, are, are um, things, just things to note in the text. I'll highlight plywood column later when I find it. Uh, the security men had receded. The lights changed. The blues and whites of the snowstorm replaced by a fluorescent glare 
that seemed yellow by comparison. Jeevan worked silently in the margarine light. Oh, I love that word, margarine light. And glancing sometimes at Arthur's face, please, he thought, please. Arthur's eyes were closed. There was movement in the curtain, someone batting at the fabric and fumbling for an opening from the other side. And then an older man in a grey suit was kneeling on the other side of Arthur's chest. I'm a cardiologist, he said, Walter Jacoby. His eyes were magnified by his glasses and his hair had gone wispy on the top of his head. Jeevan Chaudhary, Jeevan said. He wasn't sure how long he'd been here. People were moving around him, but everyone seemed distant and indistinct except Arthur, and now this other man who joined them. It was like being in the eye of a storm, Jeevan thought. He and Walter and Arthur here together in the calm. Walter touched the actor's forehead once, gently, like a parent soothing a fevered child. Now this, this idea of storms, it's, it's one of the motifs of uh, the play, I think. Or, you know, it's sort of a storm is kind of sim symbolises you know, trouble, and it's you know it's central to the play King Lear. And short, and, and the end of the world is kind of represented as a, as a kind of a storm as well. And very soon, Jeevan will go out into the um, outside world and be in the middle of a, a storm as well. And here uh, they are, um, it feels like they're in the middle of a storm. The storm's going on all around them as they, they're almost cocooned trying to work on this guy as everything else, else is happening around them. There's also later a uh, paperweight which has a storm inside a, a glass, one of those glass things you can shake. It was being like being in the eye of a storm, Jeeve even thought. He and Walter and Arthur here together in the calm. Walter touched the actor's forehead once gently like a parent soothing a fevered child. They've called an ambulance, Walter said. The fallen curtain lent an unexpected intimacy to the stage. And, and note also the curtain and the way that the curtain is, is kind of used to shape off the uh, real world, the world of the audience and the outside world from, you know, the world of the stage. And here the world of the stage is, is called intimate and it's that idea of a, a small area kind of being closed off uh, for a time. You know, those three guys are in the eye of the storm they're on stage. There's the curtain. Earlier we had the um, the parting of the curtain, movement at the curtain, somebody batting at it, trying to get in an opening from the other side. An idea of there being another side, the world of the stage, and uh, and the real world. Jeevan was thinking of the time he'd interviewed Arthur in Los Angeles years ago now, during his brief career as an entertainment journalist. He was thinking of his girlfriend Laura. Just uh, this. This character Jeevan, he um, he turns up. He's he's one of the main characters in the uh, novel, and this uh, interview, it just his his own little history is, is quite interesting. He had a, a brief career as an entertainment journalist, and he's actually interviewed Arthur years ago now. And that interview does turn up later in this text. He was thinking of his girlfriend Laura, wondering if she was waiting in her front row seat, or if she might have gone out to the lobby. He was thinking, please start breathing again, please. He was thinking about the way the dropped curtain closed off the fourth wall. There it is there. Um, and I'll explain that in a second. And turned the stage into a room, albeit a room with a cavernous space instead of a ceiling, fathoms of catwalks and lights between which a soul might slip undetected. And that soul that's slipping up into that dark roof, you might imagine that that's Arthur uh, slipping away. But this fourth wall here, I just need to explain that this is a, a concept, it, you know, that's um, used in relation to theatre. And if you imagine a stage, you have three walls of the stage and then the fourth wall is where you would have the, um, the division between the real world and the stage, so where the audience sits and where the real, where the world of the th theatre is. So the, the theatrical non-real world divided across this kind of invisible fourth wall 
uh, where the audience sits. And when the curtains close, this fourth wall is actually closed off from the audience. Okay, so going on. That's a ridiculous thought, Jeevan told himself. Don't be stupid. But now there was a prickling at the back of his neck, a sense of being watched from above. And that's a kind of freaky idea that now has Arthur already left his body and drifted up into the ceiling? Do you want me to take a turn? Walter asked. Jeevan understood that the cardiologist felt useless, so he nodded and raised his hands from Arthur's chest, and Walter picked up the rhythm. Not quite a room, Jeevan thought now, looking around the stage. It was too transitory. All those doorways and dark spaces between wings, the missing ceiling. It was more like a terminal, he thought, a train station or an airport everyone passing quickly through. Now this this here is another kind of motif in the in the novel that a terminal. Now we have later in the novel uh, an airport terminal which becomes a fairly uh, significant part of the text. A, a big chunk of the text is actually set there and uh, the idea that terminals are places where everyone passes quickly through and that's what happens in our world. But in the new world after after this flu that comes and changes everything. Actually, the, the terminal becomes, well, as the name suggests, the end. Terminal means the end. And in fact, all the people who enter the terminal, they don't pass quickly through. They stay there and they make their lives there. And so she's playing, the author's playing with all of these images of, of you know, terminals that we move through on, on journeys stages that are you know, where the, the fake world is the world of the theater or the make-believe is closed off from the real world by you know the fourth wall but actually that there is a fluidity there so the transitory or the doorways and dark spaces so what she's kind of referring to here is is the idea that there isn't a clear and simple distinction between the theatrical world of the unreal, the made-up world, and the real, authentic, real world. And she likes to play with this idea throughout the text. So as we go through the text, we'll see that this, this she's interested in this unclear or fluid distinction between the real and, um, you know, what is real and what is performance, I suppose. The ambulance had arrived, a pair of medics approaching through the absurdly still-falling snow, and they, then they were upon the fallen actor like crows, a man and a woman in dark uniforms, crowding Jeevan aside, the woman so young she could have passed as a teenager. Jeevan rose and stepped back. The column against which Arthur had collapsed was smooth and polished under his fingertips, wood painted to look like stone. So there's that another reference to the world of the make-believe. One of the other things that I just want to draw attention to as well is the use of the characters' names, Edgar and Gloucester, um, through the, the this chapter. And it's one of the things that, that this author does um, is to kind of distance the real people behind these characters by using their, the names of the characters that they're playing. There were stagehands everywhere, actors, nameless functionaries with clipboards. For God's sake, Jeevan heard one of them say, can no one stop the goddamn snow? Reagan and Cordelia were holding hands and crying by the curtain. Now, Reagan and Cordelia are two of King Lear's daughters in the play, so they're character names. Cordelia is the, the loved daughter, uh, the youngest one. Edgar sitting cross-legged on the floor nearby with his hand over his mouth. Goneril, she's another one of the daughters, spoke quietly into her cell phone. Fake eyelashes cast shadows over her eyes. No one looked at Jeevan, and it occurred to him that his role in this performance was done. So here, there's more of that playing with the difference between what's real and what's performance. So he's, this is a real death on the stage, uh, but he has played a role um, in this performance. The medics didn't seem to be succeeding. He wanted to find Laura. She was probably waiting for him in the lobby, upset. She might. This was a distinct, a distant consideration, but a consideration nonetheless. Find his actions admirable. And I quite like the way the author uh, humanises the characters by showing some of these ordinary but maybe less admirable traits or thoughts. Someone finally succeeded in turning off the snow. 
the last few translucencies drifting down. Jeevan was looking for the easiest way to exit the scene. And here again, exit the scene. We've got that play between real, uh, the real world and the stage. When he heard a whimper and there was a child whom he noticed earlier, a small actress kneeling on the stage beside, kneeling on the stage beside the next plywood pillar to his left. Jeevan had seen the play four times, but never before with children, and he'd thought it an innovative bit of staging. The girl was seven or eight. She kept wiping her eyes in a motion that left streaks of makeup on both her face and the back of her hand. Clear, one of the medics said, and the other moved back while he shocked the body. Hello, Jeevan said to the girl. He knelt before her. Why had no one come to take her away from all of this? She was watching the medics. He had no experience with children, although he'd always wanted one or two of his own and wasn't exactly sure how to speak to them. Clear, the medic said again. You don't want to look at that, Jeevan said. He's going to die, isn't he? She was breathing in little sobs. I don't know. He wanted to say something reassuring, but he had to concede that it didn't look good. Arthur was motionless on stage, shocked twice. Walter holding the man's wrist and staring grimly into the distance while he waited for a pulse. What's your name? Kirsten, the girl said. I'm Kirsten Raymond. The stage makeup was disconcerting. Kirsten, Jeevan said. Where's your mum? Mum, we say in Australia. Where's your mum? She doesn't pick me up till 11. Just note, notice here some of the... Uh, this word 11, if you don't run a little search on the word 11, it appears many many times in this this text and in, in the uh, video I made on themes I talk a bit about 11 and how it kind of represents a time just before the end you know midnight representing the end it's also interesting that Kirsten's mother isn't here but this Kirsten's working and her mother's not there and she doesn't get picked up till very very late at night so I think later there's some suggestion that you know that Kirsten's mother may be a bit of a stage mum and that there you know maybe isn't enough care being taken of Kirsten by her mother and in fact Kirsten never sees her mother again uh, after this night. Call it a medic said. Who takes care of you when you're here then? Tanya's the wrangler. The girl was still staring at Arthur. She even moved to block her view. 9 14 p.m. Walter Jacoby said. The wrangler? Jeevan asked. That's what they call her, she said. She takes care of me while I'm here. So this is really impersonal, isn't it? A wrangler is somebody who you know, musters cattle and works with animals. And, you know, to call the person who's in charge of looking after small children the wrangler, it's kind of the author's using that to emphasize the fact that Kirsten's missing some real love and care in her life. A man in a suit had emerged from stage right and was speaking urgently with the medics who was strapping Arthur to a gurney. One of them shrugged and pulled the blanket down to fit an oxygen mask over Arthur's face. Jeevan realised this charade must be for Arthur's family, so they wouldn't be notified of his death via the evening news. He was moved by the decency of it. Jeevan stood and extended his hand to the sniffling child. Come on, he said, let's find Tanya, she's probably looking for you. This seemed doubtful. If Tanya were looking for her charge, surely she would have found her by now. He led the little girl into the wings, but the man in the suit had disappeared. The backstage area was chaotic, all sound and movement, shouts to clear the way as Arthur's procession passed. And here we have a procession as well. This idea of theatre and the way that his body's been taken out is for show, for the media. Walter presiding over the gurney. The parade, and it's another use of that word here, parade. The parade disappeared down the corridor towards the stage doors and the commotion swelled further in its wake, everyone crying or talking on their phones or huddled in small groups telling and retelling the story to one another. So then I look over and he's falling or barking orders or ignoring orders barked by other people. All these people, Jeevan said. He didn't like crowds very much. Do you see Tanya? And I think also here, this idea of people talking and retelling stories, this event soon becomes... A piece of art in itself in that it's become something that's told and retold as everything does in a way 
All of these people, Jeevan said, he didn't like crowds very much. Do you see Tanya? No, I don't see her anywhere. Well, Jeevan said, maybe we should stay in one place and let her find us. He remembered once having read advice to this effect in a brochure about what to do if you're lost in the woods. There were a few chairs along the back wall and he sat down in one. From here he could see the unpainted plywood back of the set. A stagehand was sweeping up the snow and all of this stuff, this, you know, is, is, is sort of emphasising, overemphasising this theatrical environment and the, the, you know, the unreality of it. Is Arthur going to be okay? Kirsten had climbed up on the chair beside him and was clutching the fabric of her dress in both fists. Just now, Jeevan said, he was doing the thing he loved best in the world. He was basing this on an interview he'd read a month ago, Arthur talking to the Globe and the Mail. I've waited all my life to be old enough to play Lear, and there's nothing I love more than being on stage, the immediacy of it. But the words seemed hollow in retrospect. Arthur was primarily a film actor, and who in Hollywood longs to be older? So again, is there a suggestion here that Arthur has been, you know, playing it up in the media and creating an image for himself which may not be entirely authentic? Um, we're getting the author is gradually letting us in, you know, on the fact that Arthur's quite, he's very famous, he's a film actor, Hollywood actor, and uh, it's going to be big news when he dies. Kirsten was quiet. My point is, if acting was the last thing he ever did, Jeevan said, then the last thing he ever did was something that made him happy. Was that the last thing he ever did? I think it was. I'm so sorry. The snow was a glimmering pile behind the set now, a little mountain. It's the thing I love most in the world too, Kirsten said, after some time had passed. What is? Acting, she said. And that was when a young woman with a tear-streaked face emerged from the crowd, arms outstretched. The woman barely glanced at Jeevan as she took Kirsten's hand. Kirsten looked back once over her shoulder and was gone. Jeevan rose and walked out onto the stage. No one stopped him. He half expected to see Laura waiting where he'd left her in front row centre. How much time had passed. But when he found his way through the velvet curtains, the audience was gone. Ushers sweeping and picking up dropped programs between rows. A forgotten scarf draped over the back of a seat. He made his way out into the red carpet extravagance of the lobby, careful not to meet the usher's eyes, and in the lobby a few remnants of the audience still lingered, but Laura wasn't among them. He called her, but she'd turned off her phone for the performance and apparently hadn't turned it back on. Laura, he said to her voicemail, I'm in the lobby, I don't know where you are. He stood in the doorway of the ladies' lounge and called out to the attendant. But she replied that the lounge was empty. He circled the lobby once and went to the coat check where his overcoat was among the last few hanging in the racks. Laura's blue coat was gone. So she's left him there. His girlfriend has left. Snow was falling on Yong Street. It started. It startled Jeevan when he left the theatre. This echo of the plastic translucencies that still clung to his jacket from the stage. And I love that. And the idea that there's real snow outside and, and she's called it an echo of the plastic translucencies. Um, I just really like that bit. A half a dozen paparazzi. Uh, now, I'm sure you all know what paparazzi are. They're those photographers that, that follow celebrities around and t try to capture photos of them doing all sorts of things, going about their daily lives. A half a dozen paparazzi had been spending the evening outside the stage door. Arthur wasn't as famous as he had been, but his pictures still sold, especially now that he was involved in a gladiatorial divorce with a model actress who cheated on him with a director. Until very recently, Jeevan had been a paparazzo himself. So more information about Jeevan. He used to be an entertainment journalist, and he also used to be a paparazzo, so a photographer of celebrities. He'd hoped to slip past his former colleagues unnoticed, but these were men whose professional skills included an ability to notice people trying to slip past them, and they were upon him all at once. You look good, one of them said. Fancy coat you've got there. Jeevan was wearing his pea coat, which wasn't quite warm enough, but had the desired effect of making him look less like his former colleagues, 
who had a tendency towards puffy jackets and jeans. Where have you been, man? Tending barge even said, training to be a paramedic. EMS? For real? You want to scrape drunks off the sidewalk for a living? I want to do something that matters, if that's what you mean. So here, I want to do something that matters. This is Jeevan, and when he reappears in the text, this is, you know, his his journey is to find a vocation, a job that's really important to him. So we've had the entertainment journalist, the paparazzo, and uh, now he's trying to do something else. Yeah, okay, you are inside, weren't you? What happened? A few of them were speaking into their phones. I'm telling you, the man's dead, one of them was saying near Jeevan. Well, sure, the snow gets in the way of the shot, but look at what I just sent you. His face in that one where they're loading him into the ambulance. I don't know what happened, Jeevan said. They just dropped the curtain in the middle of the fourth act. It was partly that he didn't want to speak with anyone just now except possibly Laura, and partly that he specifically didn't want to speak with them. You saw him take him to the ambulance. Wheeled him out here through the stage doors, one of the photographers said. He was smoking a cigarette with quick, nervous motions. Medics, ambulance, the whole nine yards. How'd he look? Honestly, like a fucking corpse. There's Botox and there's Botox, one of them said. Was there a statement? Jeevan asked. Some suit came out and talked to us. Exhaustion and wait for it. Dehydration. Several of them laughed. Always dehyd- exhaustion and dehydration with these people, right? Now, one of the things to notice is is the, kind of the dehumanisation that uh, this modern lifestyle is sort of bringing to people. People aren't people, they're suits. People, Arthur's just died and they're cracking jokes about, about how he's looked, how his dead body has looked. There's Botox and there's Botox. Several of them laughed. It's always dehydration with these these people, right? And uh, and I think that that's one of the themes here is is you know the use of the term the wrangler for um, Tanya and also the character names. People are not well connected to each other in this world. You'd think someone would tell them the Botox man said. And here it is again. There are all these people that don't have names. If someone would just find it in their hearts to pull one or two of these actors aside, be like, listen, buddy, spread the word. You've got to imbibe liquids and sleep every so often, okay? I'm afraid I saw even less than you did, Jeevan said, and pretended to receive an important call. He walked up Yonge Street with his phone pressed cold to his ear, stepped into a doorway a half block up to dial Laura's number again. Her phone was still off. So there's again this play acting, pretending and a lack of connection between people that's going on here between Jeevan and Laura. They're not getting through these telephones that facilitate the most incredible incredible connectivity, ability to communicate. They are, um, you know, they're they're not creating that. They're not, people are not connecting. It's one of the big themes of that uh, Mandel emphasises in, in the our world is, is um, that we seem to have lost our connection from each other. If he called a cab, he'd be home in half an hour, but he liked being outside in the clear air, away from other people. The snow was falling faster now. He felt extravagantly, guiltily alive. The unfairness of it, his heart pumping faultlessly, while somewhere Arthur lay cold and still. He walked north up Yonge Street with his hands deep in the pockets of his coat and snow stinging his face. Jeevan lived in Cabbage Town, north and east of the theatre. It was the kind of walk he'd have made in his twenties without thinking about it, a few miles of city with red streetcars passing, but he hadn't done the walk in some time. He wasn't sure he'd do it now, but when he turned right on Carlton Street, he felt a certain momentum and this carried him past the first streetcar stop. So we, we found out from this that Jeevan is no longer in his 20s. So just giving us a bit of information about him that he's obviously in his 30s by now. He reached Allen Gardens Park, more or less the halfway point, And this was where he found himself blindsided by an unexpected joy. Arthur died, he told himself. You couldn't save him. There's nothing to be happy about. But there was He was exhilarated because he'd wondered all his life what his profession should be. And now he was certain, absolutely certain, 
but he wanted to be a paramedic. At moments when other people could only stare, he wanted to be the one to step forward. So he was, you know, this exhilaration of finally knowing that he's found his his um, way forward. He felt an absurd, absurd desire to run into the park. It had been rendered foreign by the storm, all snow and shadows, black silhouettes of trees, the underwater shine of a glass greenhouse dome. When he was a boy, he'd like to lie on his back in the yard and watch the snow coming down upon him. Cabbage Town was visible a few blocks ahead, the snow-dimmed light of Parliament Street. His phone vibrated in his pocket. He stopped to read a text message from Laura. I had a headache, so I went home. Can you pick up milk? And here, all momentum left him. He could go no farther. The theatre tickets had been intended as a romantic gesture. A let's do something romantic because all we do is fight. And she'd abandoned him there. She'd left him on stage performing CPR on a dead actor and gone home. And now she wanted him to buy milk. Now that he'd stopped walking, Jeevan was cold. His toes were numb. So all of this is building up to showing how empty their relationship is. And and here, using Jeevan was cold, his toes were numb. We're getting that feeling of a coldness in that relationship as well. All the magic of the storm had left him, and the happiness he'd felt a moment earlier was fading. The night was dark and filled with movement, snow falling fast and silent. The cars parked on the street, swelling into soft outlines of themselves. He was afraid of what he'd say if he went home to Laura. He thought of finding a bar somewhere, but he didn't want to talk to anyone. And when he thought about it, he didn't especially want to be drunk, just to be alone for a moment while he decided where to go next. He stepped into the silence of the park. Now, I think here with Jeevan, we've had his joy at finding his vocation, what he needs to do in his life, and then we're reminded that it's work is not enough, that we also need a warmth, warmth in a relationship and genuine connection to somebody. And that's the, the end of, of that chapter. So what have we got from that chapter? Well, we've been introduced to Arthur Leander. He's our main character and he's died. So our main character for the whole novel has died in the first few pages, which is unusual. But of course, Arthur is, is fleshed out uh, through the rest of the novel. We've also been introduced to Kirsten, who's only eight years old. And we we see that she, um, like Arthur, she loves acting, but the seeds are being sown here for her life, um, having some emptiness in it in terms of her relationship with her mother, who uh, isn't very warm. And we've got Jeevan, who comes uh, is is a key character as well. He's he's there in that moment, and uh, and returns later on in the story. So the and and you know the chapters trying to create you know those threads of what's important in life you know relationships and you know what we're trying to accomplish or achieve in our working or creative lives so it's it's looking at those kinds of things and also beginning an exploration of connections between art and life and how the distinctions between them can be fluid and sometimes a little bit blurry on that note, the connection between real life and uh, and art, I just want to add some discussion of King Lear and its connections to the story. In relation to King Lear, the daughters there, uh, the older one is Goneril, uh, the second is Regan, and Cordelia is the third one. Now, the third one is the, the true daughter, and she's meant to be associated with the character Kirsten, who's... Um, a, a child in, the, in this first chapter, but later on becomes a central adult character 20 years down the track as a, as a woman of 28. She's playing Cordelia as a child in this uh, um, opening chapter, although it doesn't actually say that. I think it's implied. And then later as an adult, she plays Cordelia uh, as an adult uh, daughter. Cordelia is meant to be this young, true daughter. It's meant to be associated with Kirsten, 
Kirsten, uh, her own parents are somewhat distant to her and she loses them on this night of the um, the end of the world and never sees them again. And she, she finds later on that she can't remember their faces and remembers very, very little about them. On the other hand, she's spent a lot of time uh, hanging around the theatre with Arthur, who has been acting almost like a surrogate father to her uh, in the absence of her own parents. And she goes on to become quite obsessed with Arthur and collects uh, memorabilia about him and remembers him as a kind person who seemed to care for her. So there's that sort of connection between Cordelia the, the third, uh, the, the true daughter, and Kirsten. But there's also a connection between Arthur's wives. He has three wives, and there are, King Lear has three daughters. And it's the first of the three wives, Miranda, uh, who we don't meet until later, who is most like Cordelia in, in the sense that she is young. She's quite a lot younger than Arthur. She's sincere. She's trusting. She's authentic. And Arthur takes her on and uh, then casts her aside for Elizabeth, his next wife, who's a famous and very beautiful actress. He, he throws her away after only three years, and he comes to regret having done that. And she is also shown to, to suffer from that uh, and to have find, you know, there are repercussions for her as well have been treated uh, in that way. And because this isn't an audio book but an analysis, I don't need to worry about giving things away. So in those, uh, why do we start with Arthur's death in those in that first chapter? Well, his actions in the last moments of his life are returned to um, in the very last section of the novel in chapter 53, where we, we go inside Arthur's head and, and take in his last day on earth and and his last day on earth is also the last day of our civilization as well so it's it the two are, are mirrored we've got arthur uh, on the brink and being on the brink is is one of the themes of the novel so arthur's on the brink of the end and doesn't realize it human civilization our modern technological world is also on the brink of annihilation and doesn't realize it and we're being kind of encouraged by the author to think both at the same time about our own personal lives and and you know the fact that there none of us know what's in store for us and how long we've got and neither does our civilization know what's in store for us and how long we have and in those last in chapter 53 Arthur comes to terms with the fact that he stuffed his life up on uh, many fronts and made a mess of it he has uh, lost his marriage to Miranda, his first wife, who was the one he should have stuck with. And he's lost contact with his son, which is his biggest regret. And he has lost contact with his family, his brother in particular, who remains nameless through the entire text, but who comes to his mind uh, towards the end. And, but Arthur resolves he's going to change. And he's only 51, so still a young man. But then he dies before he has a chance to do anything. So there is in this, I think, a, um, kind of a parallel, a mirroring and uh, a warning of a personal nature, but also a warning, a social warning. He has his career, but it's not enough. He regrets everything, but mostly the loss of people, Miranda, his son, Tyler, his brother. And he re returns in that those last moments as he's dying, that bit where he grabs the bird and clutches it. He talks about a wren, which is from the play. Well, he's remembering holding a dying bird in his hand with his brother when he's seven years old. And he, and he feels the bird die in his hand, just as he himself is dying. And we're meant to think about there, I think, the fragility of life and, and things of that nature. There's all sorts of uh, interpretations that you can make. And I think what I'm trying to say here is that there that none of these connections are, are simplistic, straightforward, this equals that. But there are all of these connections and and associations and references that we are meant to kind of think about and consider as we read the um, the novel. Uh, it's also just incredibly beautifully written. So um, I hope you enjoyed that reading. And uh, yeah, do I can subscribe to Dr. English to hear the next chapter.